So Bershuschem, I'd like to just spend a few minutes with you and turn the clock back a little bit. So we're, we began yesterday, the mission on Tzadi Tess. I would like to go back for a moment to the bottom of Daf Tzadi Ches, because I think we may have missed something important, not so much for Mesechli Yivamis, but it could be something that's meaningful beyond the confines of Mesechli Yivamis. So if you have Daf Tzadi Ches, We're going to look about 20 lines up from the bottom of the daf. And we're going to see a line that starts with umi mehema. So just give yourself a minute to tell me if you found it. You found it? Umi mehema? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going back a little bit to Tzadi Ches. Right. 90, 98. And we're looking, yeah, yeah. For, we're looking for a line that begins. It's towards the last, let's say, fourth of the page, last quarter of the page that starts with Mi Mehemon. In the Gemara. In the Gemara. And the, I'm just, I'm just going to sort of take a moment to bring bring you up to date, so to speak. In other words, what, what the Gemara is objecting, is he believed? Well, what is that all about? Who, who has to be believed about what? And this has to do with a leniency of Rabbi Akiva. There was a fellow, you may remember, he has a very strange name. He's called Ben Yasin. Yasin. And he quoted Rabbi Akiva to the effect that a ger is allowed to marry the wife of his half brother, <coughs> excuse me, of his half brother. You remember that with Goyim, we don't really assume brotherhood from the father. Uh, what was the word you used on uh, licentious or some, whatever that word was, I don't remember. Right, there's a lot of, uh, of hanky-panky. Okay, but we know who the mother is. So a man has a sister, they're not Jewish, and that sister is his maternal sister. So that, right, they're both born from the same woman. And then he was misguided, he became a gay. Okay. Now, now that woman, who's his mother, gave birth to a boy who is now his brother. But they're only brothers biologically because they share the same mother. Halachically, since he was a ger, and you remember the principle of Kikot and Shinola Dami, He's not related to his own biological brother. And therefore, if his brother was married to someone and then his brother died, he could marry his sister-in-law. Again, it's not his sister-in-law in, in Jewish law, but biologically, it's his sister-in-law. This is a woman who was married to his brother, his maternal brother. And this Ben Yasmin quoted Rabbi Akiva to the effect that Rabbi Akiva Paskin that he's allowed to marry his sister-in-law in this case. And now the Gemara is going into a discussion and analysis as to whether or not we should trust him. Meaning, should we trust this Ben Yasmin in his transmission of Torah? He's transmitting Torah in the name of Rabbi Akiva. And the Gemara says, Well, Shemora halacha uba. If a Talmud Chacham, and I get the impression here that this Ben Yasmin fits that category, he's a Talmud Chacham, but he quotes his Rebbe on a halacha that we never heard from any other source. 
and we trust it. Again, you, you might ask me, why, why should we not, why should we qu question the trustworthiness of a Talmud Chacham? But within the laws of transmitting Torah, there are rules that are not made to be broken. There are technical rules. And one of those rules is, as formulated by Rabbi Abba in the name of Rav Huna, in the name of Rav, is that im kodem maisa amra, shomen lo, but im lav ein shomen lo. What that means is that if there's no case, actual case on the table of, of the courts, then shomen lo. Then we can listen and rely on the nemonis, the credibility of a Talmud Chacham quoting his Rebbe, because there's no case that's actually being addressed by that halachic ruling. But if it's lav, lav meaning that right now we have an issue on the table and we have to paskin on it, comes a Talmud Chacham and he says, well, I have a transmission from my Rebbe about this exact case that's on the table. We've never heard from any other source that ruling in the name of that Chacham. Ain't Shomim. Since he's being Machadish Adin that we never heard about, we're, we, we, again, don't ask me the question of why we should suspect a Chacham of lying. Leave that question for later on. But the Gemara is saying that we're afraid that maybe this ruling, which he's quoting in the name of his Rebbe, is not reliable. He's only saying it because he, he wants to rule and determine Allah in this particular case that we have sitting on the table. And therefore, the Gemara says, based on this principle of Rav, that we don't rely on the transmission of a Chacham in the name of his Rebbe in a, in a halacha that we never heard about, if it's already on the table, how can we believe and Yasmin, to the effect that Rabbi Akiva was Matir Agar to marry his biological sister-in-law. It's a din that we never heard about. So the Gemara offers a number of answers to this question. Let's just review them quickly. First of all, Ibois Ema Mora Uboha. And that means that Ben Yasmin was giving us an entire list of halachos, of rulings that he heard from his Rebbe Rabbi Akiva. And this was one of them. And since we have no reason to suspect him on any of the other rulings, which were Kodem Maisa, then we'll accept him on this ruling as well. It's sort of swallowed up. It's a uh, a package deal. Ibai saying that the second answer the Gemara gives is Mishum de Kamar Hare Isha Vishiva Banel. In other words, Ben Yasmin was quoting a case that actually took place. So we know that there was a, 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 an actual case of, of an Icha B'chiva Banel. And he's telling us what they would know, in other words, what they actually implemented a Psak at that situation, that gives them an extra Nehmanus. The by saying the third answer is, Chani Hacha, that Ben Yasmin testified not only about this particular ruling in and of itself, but he added to this halacha a different story, a different scenario. And he, in the context of that scenario, he quoted a drasha which Rabbi Akiva apparently darshan based on Yonah ben Amitai. At Baosa Shoch Omer had been Chagir Noseyes Ashes Ochimimo. He also gave us the drush of Rabbi Akiva about Yonah ben Amitai. 
and therefore he's believed even on this halacha. It's all, it's all a question of did he swallow it up with something else, with other halachos or other drashos, and since we believe him on those other halachos, then we believe him on this halacha as well. What was the drasha, by the way, about Yonah? It says that Yonah was swallowed up by a fish, and then it says, Vayit Hashem el Yonah Shainis Lemar. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu came back and he warned Yonah that he better go to Ninveh to, to deliver that Nevoa. And Rabbi Akiva says that since the Pasuk says, Dvar Hashem el Yonah Shainis, it Shainis Dibra Yimoshkina, Veshlish is Lo Dibra All right. So now what I want to do is I want to open up the Yalkut Urim on this Gemara. He says the following. Right, on Kodam Amaisa, we said he's believed, but Liachar Amaisa not. Is Choshishin Shehu Meshaker. The Omer Es Halacha Machmas Amaisa Shebo Liyoda. That since there was an issue that had to be ruled upon, and all of a sudden, out of the, you know, he pulls a rabbit out of his hat. Yeah, I heard from Rabbi Akiva, my Rebbe, the following ruling. We actually are afraid and suspicious that he might have, he might have, um, well, what's the word I'm looking for? He, uh, he turned out this, this uh, statement in the name of his Rebbe. But if there's no actual case that's being addressed, and he tells us so raw the name of his Rebbe, Makabumas Dvarov, the Ain Tam, there's no logic or any reasoning, Lachshol Shumachakir, to suspect that he's lying. All this is based on Rashi, and now we're going to take a look at the Ritva. Chalila says the Ritva, Lo I cannot tolerate Rashi's interpretation of this sugya because it means that we have to suspect a Tamil Chacham of lying, of conjuring up some sort of psak that, ne- that he heard, Kiyu heard from his Rebbe, and the whole thing is just a, a, a fabrication. Ella. Leave out the word sheker, says the Ritva. Chalila, to suspect the Talmud Chacham of fabricating this truth. But we're afraid of confusion. Whenever a person has to pask him, on an actual Shiloh, he gets, you know, the truth gets a little blurry in his mind. It's similar but different, and, you know, he's pressured to come up with an answer to the question, and he might mess up a little bit and say, well, that's the case that I heard from my Rebbe, but it's not exactly the case that he heard from his Rebbe. He's under the gun, he's under the pressure of coming up with an answer and a ruling on this particular case, it's a pressing issue. We have to pass him. There's a Shiloh here where this man is allowed to marry his sister-in-law. And it's very possible that the Chacham, reminding himself of what he heard from his Rebbe, who knows, maybe he heard it 25 years ago, his Rebbe's not alive anymore to testify one way or the other. There's a blurry distinction here, says the Ritva. And now we understand, says the Ritva, shiny Hoch, the Gemara says that here we believe Ben Yasmin, why? Against many answers the Gemara gave, that he brings other halachos together with this halacha, 
that he heard from his Rebbe. Once we see that he is focusing on details, and the Ritva assumes that this was an entire slew of rulings that he heard from his Rebbe, Rebbe Akiva, Osa Shah. We see from, I guess you'd say, circumstantial evidence, to Zocher, he's very sharp in his memory, and he remembers clearly, exactly, meticulously, Masha Shomar, Meoros Rabbo. Ueno Omer Dvarim Chenira Vieno, Sherabo Omer. He's not coming up and saying, well, I think that's what I heard from my Rebbe, and it fits this case like a glove. No, no, no. That's how we say he's very meticulous about transmitting the Torah exactly as he heard it. He doesn't add, he doesn't subtract. However, says the Ritva Lafi Rashi, Shetam Shema Kamas Vavishim Shoshan Shubit Shaker. Yesh Litma Shakusha Sagmara Dain Enemy Shevis. Okay, so he's quoting all the Allahs. Well, what, is, what does that prove to you? You want to know about this particular psak, you know, vis a vis a ger marrying his sister in law, Shema, Mashu, Hoyo, Lagabi, Hashashu, Meshakim. How is that going to remove your suspicion that he's lying about this whole thing? But Meshu Mosif, that he adds other details of what he heard from his Rebbe, that's not relevant to this particular whole run, this ruling. And not only that, according to Rashi, Maybe we should suspect other rulings. You know, we say that he swallows it up with other rulings. Maybe the other rulings are also shekel. Because, again, if for some reason he has, again, heaven forbid, but that's what Rashi seems to be saying, he has vested interest in falsifying the truth, then if he wants to convince us, oh, I'm, you know, I'm a good guy, I'm certainly telling you the truth, what he'll do is, what full Rama he'll embellish it with other rulings that he heard from his Rebbe, but the, the whole thing might be a bluff. You know, if the guy is, is suspect to be a, pardon the expression, a liar, then he'll use any method, he's very sharp, to convince us that he's telling the truth. So he'll embellish it, you know, with a whole story. And he'll give us other whole rules. Now at this point, he quotes Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam has a whole different understanding of this Gemara. When the Gemara says that im kodem maise i omra is shomilo, but if it's the achra maise in shomilo, says Rabbeinu Tam, we're talking bedafka about a case where he's no gea the avis. He has some vested interest in this avis. Again, I don't know exactly how you work this out. Is then Ein Mekamas Dvarov Shekachol Rara? Let me just see it by chance. Right, but I, I just I wish I could flesh out the reality, the scenario here. Maybe he has a uh, good friend who's a gear who wants to marry uh, his own sister. I don't know exactly. I mean, unless maybe he himself is a gear. I don't know. He could be a top of the and be a gear as well, right? So maybe he's a gear. I don't know. He doesn't spell it out for us. But in any event, it's a case where that aura would have an impact on his own life. He, get a, he gains benefit from... Did you see how Rabbeinu Tam is shifting the whole, the whole business? Well, Rashi is learning that he's a shakra. And the Ritva is saying, well, he's confused by the pressure under the gun of having to pass him. But many times throws his soul out. He says the reason why we don't listen to him and we, we, we cannot give him credibility is because he's an Ogeb Eilus. But we don't have to go into questions about Chakron or, or, or anything like that. Uh, I'll give you an example. Moshe and Aaron will come to test him. Do we accept that testimony? No. Two brothers cannot test him. That's called Psulagur. That's a disqualification. We don't think that Moshe and Aaron are fabricating the truth, but the Torah says they're excluded from testimony. There's a lot of no 
if you're testifying on some case that's relevant to you, you can't be believed. The Gemara in Marcus calls it Al Pishnai Edom Yakum Davar. Yakum is Bimakaime Davar Akosum Daber. And you're not a Makaime Davar, you're a Baldomer. It's relevant to you. That's a technical tool. That's called Tzulagur. We can't accept their Edoms. And in this case, we can't accept the testimony of a Chacham vis a via Horah when he has the Gios and it's relevant to him. We're not going to say, well, oh, he's under the gun and he's making mistakes, or according to Rashi, he is, um, he is fabricating the truth. And here, Rabbeinu Tam wants to adduce a proof, evidence to a sheep. All right, so this is a sugya early in your phones that we skipped. The question is, who's believed to say in the name of his Rebbe that you're allowed to marry a Moavis? Remember the whole incident with David and Rus, whether he was allowed to marry or not allowed to marry her. So the Gemara says that there was a transmission of Torah by someone by the name of Yis- Yisra, Yisera, I don't know how to pronounce it, and he quotes his Rebbe, then you're allowed to marry a Moavis. And the Gemara says that we, can't ex- we cannot accept the testimony of Yasra Ah, he was a half brother to David Amel. He married the daughter of Yishai. <clears throat> One second, not a half brother. The daughter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a half brother. Now, Yishai, who's mentioned in Megillus Rus, is a descendant of Rus, and Rus and Boaz. Do you remember that? The Yishai, Yolad, es, es David. That's the end of the last few words in, in Megillus Rus. So anyone who's married to a child, the offspring of Yishai, has to know that you'd be allowed to marry Rus, because even though she's from Moab, she's a Moaviah, and the Torah did not prohibit Moaviah. Says Rabbi Nutan, you see from this Gemara that the reason why we suspect, in this case Yisra, who quotes his Rebbe, that you're allowed to marry Moaviah, and we think that he's not reliable, is because he's no Gavin Dover. He was married to the daughter of Isha. Is Muchach mea Gemara, Yesh Nafkabina Lachachom, mea Ras Rabo, the Hora of his Rebbe, which he now used was quoting in the name of his Rebbe, that you're allowed to marry Movia is relevant to himself. Now he has another raya from our Gemara that we learned here. In a case of a ger that testified about his wife and seven sons, in our Gemara, he actually married his sister-in-law. So you see from all these Gemaras, that this din that we don't rely on a chacham is only in cases where the chacham has an agir, that this hora is no dare to he himself, and therefore he's excluded from credibility because it's no gear, the hora zu, yeshlo negir. Now, finally, 
the Meiri quotes two opinions. Aleph. So now the question is, what do we do with Yisra? Yisra, the Gemara says, we don't rely on him when he quotes his Rebbe as saying, you're allowed to marry a Moifiyah. That's only because, as Rabbi Natam says, he has an Agir. He was married to Bas Yisha. Says the Meiri, Yisra lo hoya, Yisra lo hoya negeah. I don't know. He doesn't have this whole assumption that Yisra was married to the Bas Yisha. Bez. Now we have another opinion quoted by the B. That he's got a situation which is parallel or analogous to the situation of the Ora B'Shem Bravo. O Shepam Hoyelo Maisa Do Melo Ra Shoy B'Sap B'Shem Bravo. But we'll find him Elu Dafka Eim Lekav L'Stvarov and that's Rabbi Nitaam. But we'll chokha l'kach hu mima she Yisra hoysa lo shaychus l'ma shu sipa B'Shem Bravo kevon she hu hoya ben achoso shel dovu. Ah, was the nephew. We said before that he was a brother of the Lord. Okay. In Cain, Ach, who hoya ba, mitzad ach, mitzad echod mizara, shall rusa moavia. Sorry, he says the following. Yisra Hoysel Shaykhis, according to the second interpretation of the Meiri, Haven Shahoya Ben Achosu Shal David, and Kane Af Hu Hoya Ba Mitzad Echod Mizara Shal Rusa Moavia. Av will be off in Shayn Loshum Shaykhis Lo Ra, Shu Misap Shayn Rabo, Makabla Misdvara. So basically, these two opinions are quoted in the Meiri as two different views. One view is that we don't trust and rely on the hurrah of a Talmud B'Shem Rabbo if the Misa is on the table, even if he has no Nagiyas. And the second opinion is that of Rabbeinu Tam, quoted here in the Me'iri in different words, that only if he has a Nagiya Be'edus, then we don't accept his, his testimony. So to speak. Now, we had a drosha, with this we'll finish up for today, of Rabbi Akiva, that the Shechina spoke to Yonah Shtei Piyam, only twice. And there was no third time. Kavanosel she Rabbi Akiva hoisa lomar she odos ha'ir ninve ha Shechina lo dibra ito pam no There was no need for the Shechina to speak to Yonah a third occasion as far as going to Nidmet, because Yonah got the message. So even if you find that the Shechina did appear and speak to, to Yonah other, on other occasions, that's not a contradiction to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva is only talking in the context of Nidmet. So now we have a cache of Tosfus. Matsinu Sheshina Dibra im Yona Pamno Sefis be in your ninve. She came cause of the posuk. Bayoma Sheme el Yona, Haitiv Choralacha Alakikayon. You remember that Yona, after he delivered the message to Ninve, he was sitting underneath this, uh, this Semach, this whatever it is, uh, Kikayon. And he got the uh, pleasure of shade in the hot sun, and then the kikayon withered away, and Yonah was suffering from the blazing hot sun. And Hashem appeared to Yonah, and he said, why are you upset about the, the kikayon? Because now you don't have shade, it doesn't afford to shade. Well, I'm a, I, I'd be upset about the destruction of, of untold numbers of B'nai Nidhan. 
In any event, we see clearly that the, that Hakadosh Baruch Hu did appear to Yona and speak to Yona about Ninveh a third time. In other words, there was no need for Kodesh Baruch to speak and communicate with Yonah a third time in order to urge him to show up and transmit the message of the Nevoa and the warning to Ninveh. After the Misa of the Kikayon, which was after Yonah had already delivered the prophetic message and the warning to the Anshin Ninveh, at that point, Ashkodesh Baruch Hu appeared to him to explain and justify why he, with a capital H, was very concerned about destroying Ninveh. Kikhan <laughs> Okay, with this, we, we could finish up. I mean, he just adds another dimension here that the last third time that the Shkina spoke to Yona, it was about something else. I mean, obviously related to Ninveh, but a, a, a different perspective on this whole episode with Anshe Ninveh and the Chuba. The purpose of the third communication to Yona, the Debra of Shechina, was because Yona was upset that God had accepted the tshuva of Anshin Ninveh. They were not sincere about the tshuva. And in fact, I think history bears out Yona to be correct, because I think the Anshin Ninveh, you know, reverted back to their original, their original, you know, evil, if I'm not mistaken. I have to just uh, double check that. But that's how I remember in any event, Yonah felt that the Anshe Ninve were only doing, so to speak, a tshuva in order to prevent their own destruction. But it wasn't a sincere, long-lasting, you know, steadfast tshuva. And therefore, Yonah questioned, in his mind at least, the divine decision to save Ninve because they did tshuva. Right, he was sent out of Shtikos to get to the Anshin Ninveh to do Tshuva, which he succeeded in doing. But he says, God, why, why would you let him go, let him off the hook and spare the city from destruction simply because of their Tshuva? That Tshuva is not reliable. Okay, then, so this is where we'll stop for today. Just take a little note of it here. Omar Avino. Okay. So I just wanted to ask you, Steve, are you interested in photocopying one or two more of these pages? I mean, it's up to you. So then we'll have it for tomorrow from the Yalka Biru. Yeah, we got up to here. Oh, no, it's an easier one. So again, I'm not sure. I don't know if we can take a vote on it. But tomorrow, you know, we'll have the shia for about 40 minutes from 11.20, whether or not we should do the Hakdama to Kachim or continue in Vamos. I don't know if you have any feeling about it or you'll just leave it to me to decide. Okay. Have a good day.